we're going to start now. Uh, Igor is going to talk to us about his lessons learned from pen testing industry. Enjoy. Thank you. So I'm going to start crying you, everyone, that this morning they took my car. So I was last night working on the presentation, came to the hotel, the car towed. Now I have to take my car to the station, so I'm starting a good day in, in Balcom. So my talk is going to be about lessons learned um, in the travel industry. I come from Canary Islands. Have you ever been to Canary Islands? Do you know where Canary Islands is? Hands up. Canary Islands, two, three, four. The other, the other people should check the map. It's really near Moroccan coast, so we are in Spain and uh, beautiful beaches, lots of hotels, so as you may know, uh, our customers are usually linked to the travel industry, so we are learning some valuable lessons from there. I work in Enigma Sec, uh, only pen testing is in response and training. My team is a very young team. They're very hands-on. Every time we have to do something, we need a demo. If there is not a demo, we don't do it. So that's more or less. Uh, the talk is, is starting because, as you have seen, many industries are being breached, right? We are seeing the news that Hyatt will reach a customer payment, 41 hotels breached, Hilton was fined 700K, which I don't know if it's true or not because GDPR is kind of starting to uh, settle up and some fines are more as a precaution. It's not a, a real fine, but whoever wants to figure it out. But big chains are getting hacked. And this one is also a funny one, uh, hotel ransom by hackers, I would say criminals, as guests locked out of rooms. Have you heard this story? No, in Austria, I think. I don't know if it's true or not, but they compromised, I guess, the reception machine and the, the keys for the key cards for your uh, customers. They were not being able to print new keys or, or valid the keys. So they couldn't get in the rooms for a long time. I don't know if it's true, but figure it out for yourself. And have you heard the big story about Kaspersky, the dark hotel? Anyone? No? It's quite old and it's pushed a lot of media. Basically, Kaspersky had the research telling that they found many Asian hotels, I think there was, many luxury hotels, where executives were targeted attacks. They were going against them, like an advanced persistent threat, whatever you want to call it. The, the scheme of the attack is quite easy. So you get in your room, check in. The attacker knows what hotel you are because, as everyone knows, CEOs and big uh, people always have to show where they're going, right? In LinkedIn, in, in Twitter, like they have to, you know, move and show that you're traveling the whole world. So an attacker could just grab a flight, go there, get in the hotel, get a nice room next to the person or at least nearby and launch a, a targeted attack against customers in that hotel. And this is what we actually do in the pen testing. So this is a really mm, practical example that things can, can work. This is where I live. I know it's painful to watch, but that's the reality. So we are uh, lots of hotels, blah, blah, blah. And that's what we see in the front end, right? Like, you, well, not us, because we are geeks. But usually, the people around us are like, OK, this is a nice place to be, and, blah, and that's it, right? But on the, other, on the back end, this is actually the smart cities of beaches in Spain. Uh, and the smart, uh, in our uh, island, it's even the smart island. So even beaches are connected to Internet of Things to measure the quality of the sea, to measure if the water is safe to be swimming, because we live of tourism. If something goes wrong in, in the tourism industry, we are going to be bankrupt. So our, I think, 90% of the economy in Canary Islands is based on tourism. So what that means that everything needs to be measured, everything needs to be really, really, you know, uh, figured it out so, so we don't fail. And by watching that, we are seeing so many things interconnected on a small island. And believe me, uh, normally the truth is that it's quite messy. It's like we need costs to be really down, it needs to be fast, it needs to be easy, and you know, I guess the drill where I'm going with that. Uh, this is uh, the story behind the hotels that are getting more information to their hotel guests to be safe. This is in Sweden a couple, uh, two days ago when I was traveling to, to Belgrade. And this is your TV. And to see your flight status, nothing better than a remote desktop from your TV and to watch your gate number, right? 
Uh, but this is the small chains. The reality in small hotels is that their budget for security is also small, like their chain. So they need to be beware that if they want to imitate the bigger brands, they need to take into account that they can be quite easily hacked because obviously their budget is, is limited. This is also in, in Sweden. They're, who doesn't get their juices pressing a tablet? Everyone, right? If there's no a tablet to get my orange juice, I'm going to die. But those perks have a big price from our point of view. Like putting just a tablet where you can maybe see the corporate network of the Wi-Fi when I have my orange juice, it's a big limitation of security, right? Well, some tablets, you just need to do some figures and guess and, and touches, and you can do that just by having orange juice. So hotels really need to be careful about that. And this one, like yesterday, also in the hotel, you know that now smart TVs and hotels want you to watch your Netflix, your hook up your HBO, whatever you want to watch, and be, uh, say, um, be comfortable in your hotel room, right? Who here is going to put his or her Netflix in a hotel room? Well, people are doing it. So the, the message here is that be careful the line that is crossing the hotel industry, because they are treating like the guests like it's your home. So everything needs to be, you know, sparkling shine. Um, the lights need to be figured out by a tablet, your orange juice, your smart TV, etc. And it's all layers and layers and layers that we're seeing in hotels that can be quite uh, hacked in, in those, right? So to go back to the point of view of the talk, uh, the experiences that I'm going to summarize very quick is uh, the hotels, airplanes, airports that I cannot talk about, um, <laughs> and also uh, the shipping industry. As you may imagine, Canary Islands, we are surrounded by the Atlantic Ocean. So our second biggest industry is the ship it, shipping industry, right? So I've seen also some crazy things on board there. So to start with the hotels, from the red team pen testing perspective, in the physical engagements, uh, one of the biggest uh, things that work for us is, and my team is to pretend to be a hotel guest. You know why? Because hotels, how do they treat their guests? Amazingly fine, right? So the, anything you may ask in good proportion, and if you are you know, willing to, to connect and explain the, the person from the hotel, they will just uh, be surrendered by your, by your engagement. So some things that we tried, the USB tricks. Have you used Rubber Ducky, Bash Bunny, and all the toys from Hack5? Hack5, hands up. Of course, yeah. If not, check them out. They have. It makes your life easier if you do pen testing and speeds up the things. The basic thing for those who don't know, the tricks are that these USB drives, once they plug them in, they execute whatever you want. You can execute PowerShell, you can execute uh, a, a thing to do in that, in, in that injection, right? And usually what you say and what we did and it works, we need to bring the boarding pass from our flight. So the reception is like, yeah, sure, give me the USB drive. Some tell, send us an email and we're like, okay, sure. We're going to send a, a phishing email afterwards. So the, the usage of that we can use is that we can print the board passes or unattended workstations in the reception and uh, hotel areas, there are many places that are, computers are just left by with the session open, and you only need to plug the USB ducky or bash bunny. In the ducky, I think it's six seconds, a reverse shell, I think it pops up, so six seconds, and depending how well it's done, their security will work. In most of our environments, it quite works quite brilliantly. And remember, you can stop services, you can stop the antivirus if they're running admin, most of the time they are, and if not, you just elevate the, the privilege. So this is one of the tricks. The second trick is um, uh, the Wi-Fi guest and corporate environment. We always uh, pretend to be their internet provider in the hotels, right? We can do that by using the pineapple, which is another tool very popular in Hack5. It comes from, I think, Yasegar. I think it's the origin. Yasegar, I think, is the, the original project. And basically, it, it's a device, a wireless device that you plug it in, and it will, it has many attacks vectors, but one of them is that it's going to tell that your wireless network is your network of trust. You know that, right? So when you come to your home or come to a friend's uh, house, it will auto-connect. That happens to you? 
anyone, right? So in this uh, origin, you can also launch those attacks. Nobody in the hotel guest industry is going to check if the SSID is from their home. Only they want is to log in and have internet. And this is the, the reality. And say it happens in the corporate environment, if you clone the captive portal, nobody's going to expect if it's uh, signed by the entity, even we're seeing HTTP still nowadays. So uh, Wi-Fi is still a big time and it works. And if you have a pineapple or, or an evil twin attack, have you heard about evil twin? Yeah? It will just uh, make things easier to show you. Uh, I will show you now later a demo about that. Uh, also, the kiosks, have, as you may have seen, there are lots of machines there around, like orange juice machines or whatever. And once you poke them with sticky keys, remember the trick from the sticky keys, like pressing seven times a shift and then pops up. You go out of the kiosk mode many times and then you can just pop by with a help file and get to the CMD and it depends how it's well done, which normally doesn't. You compromise that machine in seven seconds or uh, seven strikes, as they say. Uh, also with the fingers, you will see now next slides how you can play with all these kiosks just by touching it. And once you touch them, you just get outside of that kiosk and once then you can do plenty of damage. Because you know, guess what? You do, do you think they segment the network of these kiosks? Or they're on the corporate network? Most of the times they're a corporate network. Like 90% of the times to be able to IT to manage, they don't uh, segment the, the, the network, right? And after you can just play with Eternal Blue or your favorite trick, pop up a shell in that machine, be an admin, and from there, just play the, the game, right? So this is also, let's see if it works, because internet is, uh, is it going? yeah. This is also a machine we had in our office. It was a, a cyber mirror. Have you heard about that? It's a, a internet of device. Actually, it's a Linux machine. It's a mirror. Normally, it's in the receptions or in the suite, uh, suite rooms. So guests can, when they shave, they can watch videos in YouTube. They can check their Facebook, Twitter, etc. We asked the customer to give us the, the mirror. and. We were able to uh, obviously compromise the mirror, and we were playing with also with our Internet of Things and Lights phishing Hui, uh, Philips Hui. Do you heard about that? So we even figured out that once we get a shell on that uh, mirror, our lights is going to get green. And this is something visual for us to say, okay, I don't need to be waiting on the listener or whatever. It's a nice visual effect that when I see green, it's okay. When I see red it's because they killed the process that we popped up on that machine. Showing this means that people are don't realize that behind these devices are actually full uh, operating system machines. And the mirror itself, we compromise it by a pen drive, a uh, USB drive, and you couldn't get root, but just putting the any USB drive, uh, outer RAM popped up from, I think it was Ubuntu behind it. Once there, you made a shortcut, you made a shortcut to the terminal, you do sudo dash i, and it privileges, it was not sanitized, and you're root. So that was like a big laugh for our team, but this is the reality. So the message here is that uh, hotels don't know that if you can compromise these machines from their mach from that box, you can put keyloggers, you can uh, hop on other networks, uh, etc. right? This is in the boat with my friend. This is a, I, um, I think it was an iPad behind it. Look how difficult it was to hack this. Why? Let's see the internet because I use Google. This was our hardest hacking process. <laughs> Three seconds, it was, I call it the magic five fingers and it's in the boat, right? So this is something that's, that's happening. Um, also, we, uh, with all this internet of things, blah, blah, blah and uh, stuff, we figure out many hotels have their music systems also connected to the web systems and, and devices. So the whole sound of the hotel, you know, when you're in the swimming pool, uh, listening chill out music or whatever you like, you can compromise that and play some sounds. How do we do that? In this case, it was many of the times, you just fish the password of the, of the device because most of the times are even cloud-based uh, uh, solutions for hotels for music and once the receptionist gets that 
email, we fish them, we get the credentials, nothing fancy about that, or man in the middle still works in some cases. And they use also default passwords. And I want you to think that most of the time we have fun hacking these type of things, but switching music to a bomb alert in a hotel of, I don't know, whatever stars you want to have, what do you think the impact would be on the guests? What would you do? What would you do if you're in the swimming pool and you hear a fire alert in the whole sound system of the hotels? Would you stay there for a beer or would you run and possibly fall and who knows can happen, right? So this is, we did this in Christmas, I think. I don't know if this is the sound is working. But basically, if not, because Google sometimes messes around. Mm, I will show you later. But basically, uh, we figured out that this thing, ah, on the slide. But basically at 12.50, what we made, the Christmas carol stopped, and at 12.50, one second, the music starts in the whole hotel with the permission of the customer, and it was Skrillex music, you know Skrillex? So the faces were quite uh, funny, but we also did it on low volume, and you can obviously upload any MP3 file or WAV file in, in even that case, and this was old systems. We also found many systems with no default password on South systems in hotels. So if you scrape the portals, HTTP portals in that environment, especially internal, you can, you can find it, right? So, yeah. And what also worked in hotels, Pentest and industry is that the classic things will always work because they uh, are not very savvy security oriented. I'm talking especially about local hotels, the big branches like like you know, maybe they have their, obviously their SOC teams, their incident response teams, that's a, another level story. But for 80% of the hotels which still remain uh, local, these things works. So brute forcing internal portals, we were able to get credentials. Uh, have you used the, the SMB relay attack? Anyone? Hands up? No? N nobody? If you find the SMB relay attack, uh, um, you will get domain credentials basically in maybe one hour or two hours depending on the traffic of the SMB and the shares in the environment. Once you get domain credentials, you know the, the story. So that worked every single time and you get it with no, no effort. Uh, the patching systems always also fails. There are so many machines vulnerable, Eternal Blue or Blue Keep, whatever pops up, that we are able to get there and, and use even past the hash lateral movements and hop on different segments because IT in the hotels or anywhere around, they tell us, yes, everything is segmented and it's BS because it's not really segmented. They are just pretending it's not even, sometimes VLANs are even not properly configured, right? So awareness is not very good in, in, the, in this industry. We even fished with second factor authentication because people say, oh, you cannot do phishing with that. You know, a lot of you can, steal the session still and the cookie at the same time, log in to the, to the website and use that cookie for once, even with second factor authentication. So if you do those tricks, usually, I mean, this is our reality, it works. Obviously you need to be, you know, very on the keyboard, but we have seen good, good results. And now we also have this fat fatality uh, combat in the next uh, attack, which is the phishing attack that we always do. I'm sure, have you heard the fraud CEO attack, right? Fraud CEO attack? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best phishing attack, yeah. Basically, it's, uh, it's based that you need to pretend to be a customer from the hotel or whatever thing you are doing in the pen testing. And you have to fake or the invoice, which I think it's too risky, and this is the lessons we learned. It actually never works uh, because the invoice, when it gets to the person who is paying the invoice, will just watch and say, hey, this is not an invoice that I recognize, right? So what the attackers usually are doing and what we did in our scenarios was just to say that the bank, atta a bank account was changed. This is a much more elegant approach and it works 90% of the time that we've done it. So how does it work? You send, uh, first you fish your customer, right? You get the credentials and you get their emails. The first thing you're going to search, what is? what do you think you're going to search? Invoices, invoices, right? So you see invoices and lots of emails with invoices and you see any kind of PDF. 
you see the provider and you only have to spoof that email uh, against it because nobody has their SP SPF and DMARC set it properly. So once you do that, you attach a Word document with the bank statement that you change the bank account. Where do you get a logo from the bank? Google, right? So you just put the logo bank, you just put the new bank account is this, and we are changing this because of uh, an audit that we are having uh, right now with Deloitte or whatever company, fancy KPMG that now they're giving a talk. You can just put that, send the email, and the trick is also that to this phishing cast, uh, victim, you need to spoof a phone call. Have you done spoof calls with voice over IP and spoofing the, the header when you call? Never did that? It still works, like nowadays, and it's super easy to demonstrate. If later of the talk somebody wants, you only need to know the two phone calls, right? From the, from the victim and from the provider that you're pretending to be. Once the provider gets the phone call and sees in his or her phone that this is Peter from, uh, from your own uh, provider department, you just take the phone and you speak with them, and what do you say? I'm asking you, what do you say? I'm Peter? But they will say, you're not Peter. Your voice changed. What happened with Peter? So the only thing you have to say is that Peter is not here. Peter asked me for this big favor. We are in a mess with this audit. Everybody's going crazy. I'm just going to send you an email with this new uh, bank statement, officially stamped, uh, with our new bank account. It's OK that with you? Yeah, sure. Send it this morning. OK. You wait one hour. You send an email. And we actually. The CEO of the company normally gives us a bank account, internal bank account, and we see our biggest uh, phishing attack was 50 something thousand euros that popped, up, popped by in another account, only because you did a phishing with a spoofing email account. You can mess up with Bluetooth also and, uh, and, and try to you know, be more intrusive against that. We usually don't do that. This is a much simpler approach, and this is something that works every single time. So if you want to investigate, search for the term vishing, which is, you know, everybody has now a term for all these kind of things, and you will see that setting up this uh, attack is easy. From the approach from airlines or airports, whatever, you know that many airlines offer now free Wi-Fi, right, on board. So we had a flight, and this flight didn't have Wi-Fi, so what do you think we did? We give you Wi-Fi. You only need to put the faces ID with the same thing and a similar portal, right? What do you think the customers of that flight did? They connect to us. So once they connect to us, we also, I will show you the evil twin thing so you can see where you can play. In this case, obviously this is a demo with internet, but even it will work if, if it's it. So you connect to this free Wi-Fi, this is your mobile phone or, or whatever, you open a website, which is a Spanish newspaper we have, and it says, hey, wait, before you can you know, uh, serve the web, this is a demo purpose, that's why we did it so obvious, uh, you need to link with your LinkedIn account. Haven't you seen those? Like, to open something, you need to link with your account, Gmail, Facebook, whatever. So you put just LinkedIn in this case. And the funny thing is that when we were doing this presentation in Canary Islands, the, it was for non-technical, like zero, like executive people, and during the talk, somebody connected and put the LinkedIn account, and, and we were like telling 300 times that it's a fake access point, and we are going to steal your password. Still, somebody did that. Uh, true story. I, I don't BS. And uh, the the truth about this is obviously it's a deadly attack, and also you can force people to connect to you in in most of the occasions. So. Uh, you can just, you know, when you see that you're already connected, you, you don't have to pretend and ask people to connect to you. You can automize that. And if you're lazy like us, we also cloned a captive portal in the flight, and you just ask stupid questions. So it's a form to get online, and you're like, okay, what's your seat number? They put the seat number. What's your favorite color? They put the favorite color. What's your, I don't know, we asked Stephen, what is the capital of Moscow? And people said Russia. <laughs> So they don't even, they don't care. They just want the internet, like leave me alone. Uh, uh, even then we made it even a longer uh, survey just to see that this is not gonna work. And believe me, 
60% were still trying to log in and put the data. Obviously, I'm not somebody who is going to say if it's fake or not the data, but the true story is that I've seen this with our, my own eyes, and it's not like a newspaper that says, careful with Wi-Fi. If you want to try it, try it, and you will see that people on board to get internet are going to do anything. And my question to you is that if it's in a targeted attack, to one of the executives, imagine, that's movie time, uh, the victim is not going to go anywhere. So you have maybe five hours to really go against a certain person. And you can quite easily do that. That's, that's the story. Also, we have done some you know, airlines there, quite shitty airlines, sorry to be rude, but some of them had, you know, to check in and, and book, uh, make your check-in online. They only ask you for your airport from where you're leaving and the booking code. Have you seen those? And most of the time they don't even have captchas, they don't block your, you can circumvent their blocking issues, so you can brute force the check-ins because I think it's six, uh, six digits, the booking code, and the airport origins is just a list. So if you combine those two, you can brute force and have all the booking codes. We did this with an airline, quite big one, and they fix it. So if you see somebody with an airline for check-in has this type of things, uh, get scared because it's it's not it's not good and this one is also good which is the QR code every time it also works if you put free beer and you do a good design and you post it in the swimming pool of the hotels it will definitely work and then you can just use this information maybe to get more advanced attack about their customers uh, we've done even anything from upgrades to free beer and usually it works the message here is that the less you uh, the less you think about the approach and something more rational it will always work like if you try to mess up a big story and complex thing of the qr code it will not work people will not even read it i'm sure if you put a code right there and you say free rakia somebody's going to scan right at least i would so behind this message you can obviously uh, use it as a vector attack about uh, approaching the the info right and the last part that I want to show you, the physical security, you can always do that, maybe. Sometimes works, sometimes doesn't work. But uh, having heard about the Proxmark, the, the, the thing, I have the Chinese, the cheap version, sorry. Have you heard about this? Yeah? If not, check it out. And the idea is that, first I will show you more or less what it is. So it will emulate uh, RFID and FC, it can clone cards like this, like hotel cards or key cards or whatever. And you can use it offline against uh, some types of attack if you have a battery external, etc. right? So the idea behind it is that every single key, especially in MyFair, uh, MyFair I say Mifare, but it's MyFair, I guess, uh, has a unique code, UID, which you need to capture it, clone it, put it on the new key, and brute force or get the whole encryption level inside these keys, right? Some hotels use other keys, but usually my fair classic is a winner. Usually they use this in transport, they use it in, uh, I've seen in a theme park that I have to test for my little daughter, because then you have free credit in the theme park. So if you're able to clone it, maybe you can mess around with that too. Uh, you need to decrypt, as I mentioned, the, the keys in, in the uh, key A and key B in this case. And once you get those keys, you can clone it, dump it, and then what you do is restore it on a new card. And if you have the perfect match and the perfect uh, code, you have a new key. In hotels, it's true that it's not so easy as it's apparent. This is not telling like every single time you can do that. But for this case, that I brought a nice, <laughs> nice uh, key, key to show you, I will show you if how what's the approach behind it. You can always script all these things, as you know, so you can make it harder. In case it fails, I have a video, so I will try to do that uh, now. So as you see, this is the, this is the device, and as you see, the, it's not moving, right? Yeah? So if I have uh, an invalid key, it's still not moving, right? If it's the right key, Unlocked, works, right? Locked, doesn't work. Okay, so now let's use the invalid key, remember? The one that doesn't work. Okay. 
Okay, this is the boring part, so bear with me. So first, I, I hope this is plugged in. Okay, so the key is detected. You see the UID is 01, 02, 03, 04, right? Yeah? You see it? So what you, obviously we need now the key of the real key. So the attack vector is that you need to be stealing this key for, if you do it fast, maybe 60 seconds. So in that time, when somebody takes a rakia or a beer, and they leave their key on the table, you take your proxmark, and then you do this. So, so you see the UID is here, this is the real one, right? So you just copy that, and save it, take out the key, put the new, your, your spare key, whatever, to clone it. Okay, now the command to be faster. So well now what we're going to do is brute force with the dictionary attack against the key, the original one, sorry. Okay. So you see, these are the keys that are found. Obviously this is a much faster approach because there are some keys that we couldn't found, so we had to, to speed up the, the things for the demo, okay? So once we have it, we put a new key. Okay, and then we can dump And sorry, because we had to dump this one. Mm -hmm. Wait. Okay, so dump of the key. So now we are writing the dump to the new key. We also need to put the key before. work. <laughs> so if not, you can throw stones. Ah, lock, sorry, from this side. Okay, did you see? Yeah? Now applause for restoring this. <laughs> so the, real, the real story is that we have this only for a week. Like we are messing it around right now, so we are still in this phase of playing with this thing. But from our point of view, um, it's, uh, it's definitely being a potential thing with this type of cards. And there are like two more things that I want to just share with you guys. Let's see if it's internet is slow. Meanwhile, there are any questions? Because I know you have other talks if I'm out of the time. Any other questions? Using Google Slides, 
sucks with internet. Uh, can you tell us how do you change the first sector, serial number part? The first serial number, you mean the, the city you did? Yeah, yeah. yeah, you just search before with the original one. You just copy it, and then the destination card has to be unlocked. Ah, the destination card, of course. It needs to be totally readable, writable, like nothing needs to be written on this one. Go to all the experts. Yeah. yeah. You, need, you need the Chinese set UID zero cards. Yeah. And yeah, it comes with the bundle. It comes with a bunch of keys. Obviously, you need MyFair also 4K. It's not included. So there are some keys that you will not be able to perform. If you buy those keys, then you can, you can do the, the things. The, the thing that I wanted to share with you is that once you get in a locked environment like this one, or a CPD, or, or any, because I'm not talking about hotel rooms, the next thing is that you can deploy all sorts of toys, right? Have you heard the land turtle or whatever, and you just put a sticker, they're not removing the CPD? Do you think IT is going to remove it? In a, in a complex CPD, you have a sticker and you put do not remove. You think they are going to touch it? There is no way they're going to touch that. So once you put the implant, you just put it there. You have a reverse shell on the other side. You go outside uh, and you can compromise. Or you can play also with the, with the cable. Have you some, seen that one, that the cable of the phone is actually, it has, um, uh, is the same like a USB execution uh, remotely, so you can just switch inside the room of the person or the CPD and take their uh, original cable and just put yours. So that that type of things can also also work. And the last lesson that we also I want to share with you from the blue term perspective is uh, that we had a phishing attack against a customer, and they compromised the email address of a CEO, a very big CEO, and. Obviously, and some other users. So, as instant response, you know, you watch logs, you reset the passwords, you enforce second factor authentication. Those are the things we do, right? It's a question. Yes or no? Yeah, yeah. So, you are like working your ass just watching all these things, and the attacker was still inside the email of this person. Does anyone know what happened in this case? What's the dirty trick as an attacker? that you would do if you have an email address compromised of a big shot in an organization? What's the first thing you're going to do? You forward the, yes. the, all the emails and yes. change to yes. totally. Once, like this is way old trick, but in some times you're like so stressed up that you're just watching the other things and you should watch the basic things like, did the attacker put a forward email address? Because once he did it, every time the person was receiving, it was bouncing to the attacker. And it's often not a forward, but it's a mail route who copies Correct. Emails, and they also delete specific emails yeah. after forwarding it and the rule that deletes it from the trash. You have to check also all the rules. And usually in that place we, we did in that case, but we learned a hard lesson. So that's other things. And also with the public relations, fake news, all these things, have you seen this report? I know I don't have much time. I was reading it the other day. Uh, I really recommend you to read it carefully. But from the point of perspective, it's perhaps nothing new, but all these things that are happening in the world are or political or financial gains, right? So if an attacker or a person who has other beliefs needs to manipulate the, the, pub, the population, they will use all these actors together. And once using those actors, they're going to push the industry towards one way or another. If you're able to do that with uh, big, massive political attacks or fin financially gained attacks, I think it's going to be a trend and we are seeing that. And the thing that I want to share is that we should pay attention at those moments because I think are the most fear, fear ones nowadays are these ones, not just malware APT attacks and zero day attacks. It's the people attack that's going on every single time. And the, have you heard, this is the, the in the report, they talk about the Sepoy Rebellion. This is from 1857. So this is nothing to do with our day, days, but it's a great example. So you know that India had this, uh, United Kingdom was invaded almost India, right? So the Sepoy Rebellion, which were the Indian soldiers, well, people uh, made a rumor that uh, India was going to be, become a Christian country. So in the religion part, the rebels distributed chapati, which is the Indian bread, 
by knights. So people were thinking that it was a representation that they want to change to the Christian wafer, right, when they give you in the church. And others rumored that the bread was soaked in beef to force the change on locals' behavior so they can adapt to that. But the strongest was on the so Indian soldiers was the strong narrative that the weapons they used, they need uh, grease from beef and pork. So what do you think the Indian soldiers in those times when they were serving with the United Kingdom to preserve peace did? They rebelled because of a rumor, because it was officially not right. So you need to pay attention on these movements because uh, I think we are in that, in that era. And thank you, everyone. I hope to have a great time in here in Avisat. Thank you. So I don't know if you have questions or we can take any questions.